warm and clean All the secrets he has kept from her so long He finally knows her big mistake That one regret that haunts her to this day It just won't fade so many different stories we thought could not be repeated but it's against our darkest failures we start to see the beauty of the blood the goodness of this grace the mercy undeserved that could never be Heaven's best takes all the scars For the worst in all of us That's the glory of the cross The wonder of his love That's the beauty of the blood Just a single drop forever wipes away our every stain. And with its power, every chain that held us now lies at our feet. And we stand free, that's the beauty of the blood, the goodness of grace, the mercy undeserved, that could never be explained, heaven's best takes all the scars, for the worst in all of us, that's the glory of the cross, the wonder of his love, that's the beauty All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you all tonight. Glad you made it out on Wednesday evening. Uh, if you're visiting with us, thank you so much for uh, coming out this Wednesday night. And if you're joining us online, I want to welcome you uh, as well. Um, just wanted to mention, if you uh, ever want to turn in a prayer request on Wednesday night and you weren't clear on how to do that, uh, you can always turn those in uh, at our welcome desk. There'll be somebody there that you can hand those off to. Uh, and we pray for those at the end of the evening every Wednesday night. This is our Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. Uh, so just wanted to make sure you knew about that. Uh, Pastor uh, Spivey and some of our team are already uh, in Richmond preparing for our couples retreat. So if you look around and notice that uh, there's a few people missing, uh, they're down there getting ready and setting up for uh, couples retreat, always a big and exciting uh, event 
uh, for the couples of our church. And uh, a lot of us are going to be heading down uh, early tomorrow morning. Uh, so we'll be in prayer for all of those. But I hope you've had a, a great week and uh, glad you're here tonight. Looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us. I'm going to ask Brother Chance, uh, if you would, Brother Chance Massey, make your way up here uh, and get us started in a word of prayer tonight before we sing a few songs. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we love you and we thank you for tonight and thank you for the opportunity to gather together as a congregation of the family of God. Lord, we ask that you will help us to lay aside every weight that would ensnare us or weigh us down. Help us to just take off anything that would take our eyes off of you and help us to have our eyes and our hearts prepared for worship and for hearing your word tonight. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Chance. Well, here's a song you know well. It's a personal testimony. Have you ever given your testimony of knowing Christ? Well, you can sing it tonight again. Let's stand together if you would, please. Everyone standing. Love lifted me. Sing it out on the first verse together. I was seen. There's an old gospel song by the name My Plea. I love the message of it. Before we sing our next song, I want to just share these words with you if I could. Should I at the gates of heaven appear to answer the challenge, what claim hast thou here? What hast thou to offer? Yea, what is thy plea? With blessed assurance, my answer would be, all that I have is Jesus. All that I claim is Jesus. All that I want, all that I need, all that I plead is Jesus. Can you say that tonight, that, that he is your all? Amen. Let's sing it together now, if you will. Christ is all. Another personal testimony. I once was lost in darkness.
people said amen. amen you remember that old chorus Christ is all I need we just sang about that didn't we all I have is Christ and he's all we need amen. brother Andrew would you please come and lead us in prayer and let's just thank the Lord for what he's done for us and continue just asking his blessing upon this time together brother Andrew dearly father Lord we just thank you for allowing us to be here tonight to worship you to pray for others to Lord, we lift up our missionaries serving around the world, and Lord, I just thank you for that love you showed, sending your son, so that we would have a way to get to heaven, Lord. And Father, just be the speaker, and in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Andrew. Paul said, what know ye not that your body is the temple of the living spirit, the Holy Spirit? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, because they belong to him. Sanctuary, Lord, I want to be a sanctuary, a holy place where you dwell. Amen. Sing with me, please, Lord. This is a prayer to the Lord. Sing with me now. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. so much you may be seated. Brother John's coming to share the word with us tonight. You get your Bibles ready, okay? Brother John. We'll be in uh, Romans chapter 12 tonight. Romans chapter number 12, if you want to go ahead and find your place there. Thank you, sir. Romans chapter number 12. I, um, I really like coffee. I, I do. I really like coffee. If you know me well, 
you probably already know that about me. Um, I like hiking. Um, I, I like my family. I care about my family. I like this book. I tell you, I, I, I love the Bible. I care about it. And you know what I've learned? In, in order to accomplish really anything in life, in order to, uh, for life to have any meaning at all, in order for you to find any enjoyment in life, you have to care about something. You have to care about something. And yet, you and I hear somebody say just about every day of our lives, well, I don't care. I don't care. Yeah, the Eagles didn't win the Super Bowl. I don't care. But it's funny how care can be such a fickle thing. You know, um, something else that I enjoy, I like watching um, nature shows. Uh, I, I like watching stuff like that. I enjoy uh, watching shows about nature. Did any, any of you watch stuff like that? Am I the only weird guy? Okay, there is a few of us. Okay, good. Um, I, I always um, thought it ironic, but whenever you watch um, the ones especially that are about animals, you always tend to put yourself in the position where you're kind of rooting for whatever animal the show is about. Do you do that? Do you, do you guys do that too? You kind of, you, you develop this sort of care about whatever animal the show is about today. So if tonight's episode is about the gazelle and it's telling you all these facts about the gazelle and you're learning all this, these things about gazelles, you're like, I, I don't even know if that's the right plural for gazelle. I, I haven't seen that episode yet. You're, you're cheering him on and you're like, run, use your speed, get away from the lion. And then tomorrow's episode will literally be about the lion. And you're sitting on your couch and you're like, quick, trap him. Don't let him use his speed. Get the gazelle. It's funny how your care can change from day to day based on what you're exposed to, based on your circumstances. But if you don't care, if you don't care about something, you're not going to make it. Because passion arises out of care. That's where it comes from. If you don't care, then you're never going to reach your goals in life. If you don't care, you're probably never even going to set goals. Don't raise your hands, but... Here's a question that I read recently that got me thinking. Think about this. What are your goals right now for the kingdom of God? What are you striving to accomplish for Christ today? Now, when you think about that question in light of, do I actually care about this? Well, that's kind of a convicting question, isn't it? You know, if you go to the plains of Africa, there are two types of creatures that genuinely care, and that's the lion and the gazelle. I mean, they, they care, and it shows, because the gazelle wants to live another day. But you know, that lion, he wants to eat so that he can live another day. You know who's going to win that battle? It's the one who cares the most. Romans chapter number 12. And uh, let's, let's just read these first two verses. Follow along with me there if you will. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore. He says, I beseech you therefore, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Would you join me in prayer once more tonight? Father God in heaven, teach us tonight through thy word. Empty me of self, fill me with your spirit, give us clarity tonight. God, I'm asking that you would speak tonight. Help me to say what only you would say. And close my mouth when I would speak. Use me tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One great uh, rule of thumb whenever you're, you're studying the Bible is that whenever you come across the word therefore, you should stop and see what it's there for. Why is that word there? In, in other words, go back and read what the writer is referring to because when he says Therefore, he's clearly pointing to what he was just writing about. Therefore, so when he says, I beseech you, therefore, if you'll just kind of look back up in in your Bible or scroll back up on your device there, in chapter 11, in verse number 25, all the way back up to verse 25, he says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel." Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And and pay attention to this. So all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, listen, when I shall take away their sins, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. That's, that's talking about us, the Gentiles. It says they are enemies, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. That's a lot of mercy. For God hath included them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So when the Apostle Paul wrote these words to the Romans, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by the mercies of God, or because of these mercies of God that I've just told you about, This is what he's drawing from, all that mercy that he just talked about in those verses. The mercy of God where he extended the gospel to us. By the way, he didn't have to do that, but he did. Notice he says, I beseech you. I beseech you. Brethren, he says, I implore you, I urge you. Paul is calling for attention. He's saying, hey, this is really important. This is the moment where the preacher would say, don't miss this. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, I want you to give a care about this. I beseech you that ye present your bodies. I want to draw your attention to a few things about what Paul is pleading with us to do. Number one, he says present. It's voluntary. To present. Voluntary, literally like a, like a, like a gift, a present, if you will. Uh, an offering of appreciation. The text even implies that this is completely optional. Which means we can refuse to do this. Present. Number two, it's an individual choice. He says that ye present your bodies. Or in other words, uh, down south, you all. 
Y'all, ye, each of you must individually choose to do this. It's not a collective choice. We don't get brownie points for being a part of Crossroads Baptist Church or uh, for what our parents have done. It's what we each choose to do individually because we each will stand before God individually for what we each have done. When John Hash stands before the Lord, what Alina Hash or Heath Spivey has done or Crossroads Baptist Church has done, that's not going to have any bearing on what John Hash has done. You with me on that? You see what I'm saying? It's an individual choice. And he says that you present your bodies. And I, and I got to tell you, this, the Lord really drew my attention here to how specific this is. That you present your bodies. How, how natural would it have been for Paul to say that you present yourselves? That you present yourselves. I mean, you would think that would be the natural way that this would read. But he literally says, no, your bodies. He wanted to leave no mystery here. He doesn't say that you present yourselves. He doesn't say that you present your heart. He doesn't say that you present your life. Why? Because, quite frankly, it's it's easy to get up and for me to say, God, I give you my heart. It's easy for me to sing that every Sunday and not give it a second thought. But... When I present my body, that's not an ambiguous commitment. It's not something that we do internally. When we present our bodies, it's acted out for others to see. It encompasses our whole self. It's not partial surrender. It's total surrender. Because what, wherever my body goes and what I subject my body to, my mind and my heart are going to follow. Because they're, you know, in there. How do I give my body to Christ? Well, it's, it's doing what he would do if he were here in bodily form. That is our job. Christian. Which leads us to this next phrase. And this is really the meat of the message tonight. It says a living sacrifice. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Sacrifice. Inevitably, whenever we hear the word sacrifice, where does your mind go? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. Our minds are drawn to the Old Testament. The priest would uh, place a a, a dead animal, uh, a, a lamb, an ox, a goat, place a dead animal on the altar and offer it to the Lord based on the commands given by God in the law of Moses. When I hear the word sacrifice, that's exactly where my mind goes. By the way, animal sacrifice never took away sin. In fact, Scripture is very clear and consistent in that fact. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, the Word of God says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. That is not how those in the Old Testament were saved. No, it was, it was a picture. They were saved just like you and I were, are. Uh, we're just looking back to something that's already taken place on the cross while they were looking forward to it. But I want you to uh, notice something. Um, it was a dead animal. It was a dead animal. And if you read the law of Moses and you pay attention to the instructions of offering a sacrifice, those animals were killed before they were placed on the altar. Did you ever think about that? If, if, you, if you don't mind, just if you've got your ribbon or, or just stick your finger there in, in Romans and go back with me to Exodus chapter 29. Um, I, I want to I draw your attention to this. Exodus chapter number 29, and we're gonna, I'm going to go to, uh, to verse 11. I'm going to start in verse 11. Exodus chapter 29. We'll just, I just want to show you a few things so you can see what I'm seeing here. So in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus chapter number 29, 
there in verse number 11, the Bible says, And thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So where, where's, where's he killing this bull? He's, he's over here by the door of the tabernacle. The altar's way out here in the, in the courtyard. Okay? And then down in verse 13, thou shalt take all the fat that covereth the in, inwards and the caul that is above the liver, the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, and burn them upon the altar. So he, he's, he's already killed this animal and now he's taking parts of this dead animal, placing them on the altar, and then he's going to burn them there. Okay? Look, look, at, um, look at verse 16. Same chapter, Exodus 29, verse 16. Thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood and sprinkle it round about upon the altar, verse 17, and thou shalt cut the ram in pieces. And wash the inwards of him and his legs, and put them upon his pieces and unto his head. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The sacrifices were, by definition, already dead. How can something that's already dead be a living sacrifice? You know, um, there was only one example of anything living really being placed on an altar in the Old Testament. You know what it is? It was Abraham's son. It was Abraham's son. You know what that was picturing. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be graphic here, but can you imagine the scene if you tried to take a live animal like a goat or something like that and you placed it atop a stone altar and then you, you try to light that thing on fire, do you think he's really going to stay put? That's not happening, okay? <laughs> he's, he's gone. Um, uh, we, we have an English bulldog at my house. We have an English bulldog. His, uh, he is the comic relief in our home. His name is Cosmo. Okay, Cosmo. Cosmo is our bulldog. Um, Cosmo has uh, allergies. Sometimes his eyes get a little irritated, so we have to give him eye drops in his eyes. Um, and uh, Cosmo does not like getting eye drops in his eyes. Uh, so he, he protests. Um, if you're ever having trouble picturing what it would look like uh, what a goat would look like trying to escape from the fire on top of an altar. Come to my house and watch us try to give Cosmo his eye drops the next time he needs them because he truly believes he's about to be sacrificed. Whenever that happens, um, it, it really, it literally looks like a scene out of Scooby-Doo because he takes off running and he's kind of stuck in one place for a minute. Um, and then he uh, hides behind a piece of furniture and just kind of peeks out like, what are you doing? Um, but yeah, that's, that's Cosmo. Uh, animal uh, sacrifice was, it was an observance of faith. It was a picture of the perfect sacrifice yet to come. And that was Jesus Christ. That was Jesus Christ. He, he was a living sacrifice. He, he is the Lamb of God. He willingly laid down his life. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 2, the Word of God says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God or a sweet-smelling savor. It's amazing how that verse compares to what we just read about the Old Testament sacrifice. Imagine the discipline, especially when you think about Abraham and Isaac, the discipline to obey when you are told to lay on that altar and just accept and trust whatever is coming. But that's what Christ did for you and I. 
That's what it means to choose to become a living sacrifice. And it was all because he cared for us. Jesus is our great teacher. He is our example. And he redeemed us so that we can learn how to live. I'm going to borrow an analogy that I read recently in a great book entitled Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus. Imagine that you've been handed a piece of sheet music to an absolutely beautiful arrangement. And, and you've never heard the entire arrangement performed, but then one day you have the opportunity to meet the composer's son. He knows his father's music by heart, and not only that, he's an incredibly skilled musician. So this, this composer's son, he sits down at the piano with a microphone, and he plays with our music team. He sings the lyrics, and the music is so beautiful and so powerful that you begin to weep. At last, you are hearing the arrangement being played Exactly as the composer intended for it to sound. You know, that's what Jesus has done for us. Not only telling us, but showing us what human beings created in God's image were meant to become. While I was in college, one of the required um, uh, books uh, for us to read was Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, it's, it's probably the most moving uh, book I've ever read. I want to share this quote with you. Not every Christian will be called upon to die a martyr's death. But we have all been called upon to live a martyr's life. Think about that. Not every Christian will be called upon to die a martyr's death, but we have all been called to live a martyr's life. You see, in the Old Testament, the believer chose to bring a sacrifice to God. But in the New Testament, the believer chooses to be the sacrifice to God. Romans chapter 12, again, verse number 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And he continues on, holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. He says holy. Holy. Holy means consecrated, set aside for a special purpose, morally blameless. Morally blameless. We're called to be holy. Holy also means entire. You think, Whole, whole, holy, not partial, but whole, holy, all of us. He says, holy, acceptable unto God, acceptable. Acceptable means well-pleasing. In fact, sometimes this word is actually translated as well-pleasing in Scripture, uh, acceptable unto God, well-pleasing, or fully agreeable. It's the exact same root word we find in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. You'll recognize exactly what's happening when I read you this verse. It says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well-pleased. God speaking to Jesus right after He was baptized. And that... Is the sentiment, as God is expressing this sentiment to his son Jesus Christ, that is the word that is used here when he says, I want you to be acceptable. I want you to be well pleasing. To obey, to follow in the footsteps of Christ. But the next phrase brings us to the bottom line when it says, which is our reasonable service. Our reasonable service. Reasonable service. Reasonable, or you could say 
It's rational. It's a logical response. A logical response. That word uh, service that appears here, it's the Greek word, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, latreia. I don't claim to be a Greek expert here, but praise the Lord for modern language tools. It occurs five times in the Bible. Five times. It's often translated as service, as we see here, but uh, sometimes you'll find this word as divine service or one other word. You know what it is? Worship. Worship. But it is always the same word and it always carries with it the same meaning. It means labor of body and mind for God. It's your reasonable service, your service to God, your divine service, your worship. Your worship. And it's only a logical response. It only makes sense. In the words of Mr. Spock, to do anything else would be illogical. How could I not serve and worship him when I consider what he's done for me? What does our worship look like? We must never allow our concept of worship to be reduced to an emotional high that does not lead us to action. Let me, let me share that quote with you one more time. We must never allow our concept of worship to be reduced to an emotional high that does not lead us to action. Let's look at verse 2 once more with me, if you would. Romans chapter 12, verse number 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, Be not conformed. Be not conformed. You know that word conformed is, is passive. It's passive. Uh, in other words, he's saying don't allow yourself to be conformed by the world. Don't allow yourself to be conformed by the world. Uh, J.B. Phillips translates this phrase, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. You should know that, that Paul actually uses the, the present imperative tense, which literally means stop letting the world conform you. It's as if he was saying that the believers in Rome, were, or at least some of them, were being squeezed into that mold of the Roman world. Be not conformed to this world. Or you could even read that as, this age, this present culture. And that's where it applies here specifically to us. Christ taught that we're to be in the world but not of the world. And what does that mean? He's saying that we're to be innocent but not naive. There's a big difference there. Harmless as doves, innocent. Wise as serpents, not naive. In the world, wise, not of the world, innocent. We are to be aware and involved, but not caught up in. Does that make sense? We are, we're not being charged here to avoid things just because they happen to be popular. That, that doesn't make them wrong, okay? Uh, our priorities must always be His priorities. And my, my prayer is that God would send revival, all right? If, if people 
get on fire for God and revival spreads and that becomes a popular thing, I'm not going to be standing in its way. Praise the Lord. But we must be more concerned, always more concerned with making disciples than anything else. We must be more concerned with making disciples than a political party. We must be uh, more passionate about lifting up Christ than our own personal opinions on cultural issues. Those things are far more important. That's what he's saying when he says, be in the world, but not of it. Be not conformed to this world. And I love how God knew that how this was going to be translated in the English language and conformed, but be ye transformed. And just that beautiful parallel there, but be ye transformed. Do you know what the word transformed means? Like literally the definition of the word transformed? It means changed externally. Changed externally. That's a change that you can see on the outside. Okay, it, it, it means renewed, renewed. It's actually a, a, another Greek word, and again, I know I'm going to butcher this, but it's metamorpho. Um, this is where we get our word metamorphosis. Uh, like when a, a, a caterpillar changes into a butterfly. A caterpillar changes into a, a, a butterfly. I've actually got an image to go with this just to kind of help us visualize. It, it, it's such an amazing thing that this little, fat, squishy, ugly caterpillar is just working on this leaf and that plant and this flower, and he can just get to the point where he decides one day, okay, I've had enough of this, and he just blocks everything out and says, okay, i got to work on me now. Just kind of goes into his little thing. Most caterpillars will spend 5 to 21 days in their chrysalis, and that's where the magic happens. Don't you wish you could do that some days? Just say, all right, I'm done with you people. You don't see the change. You can't see it. But, it, it, and this is, this is the cool part, it doesn't come out a fancy new caterpillar. It comes out something completely different. It stops crawling and it starts flying. It was ugly and now it's beautiful. It's not even a caterpillar anymore. It's a butterfly. It's literally unrecognizable compared to what it was. Paul says, you be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That's how you be transformed, by the renewing of your mind. I'm going to move quickly through this so we can uh, wrap this up. Being transformed by the renewing of your mind, your, your, your mind, your heart, your spirit, your intellect, emotions, and will, your whole self... You do that by several reasons. One of them is uh, ask God. Ask God. Psalm 51.10, renew a right spirit within me. And that's a, a continual daily renewal. But what about in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6? He says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you ask, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So not only ask God, but then saturate your mind and your life. If I want to renew my mind, okay, you, you guys, you, you know these scriptural principles. If I'm constantly pouring 
good things in my eyes and in my ears, what's going to come out? Good things. But if I'm constantly allowing bad things in my eyes and in my ears, then what's going to happen to my mind? And, and what's going to come out of me? Okay? So you ask God, you saturate your mind and your life, and then you remove and replace. You remove and replace. He tells us this in Ephesians chapter 4. It says in verse 22 that you put off, put off concerning the former conversation in the old man. You put it off, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He's literally giving us specific instructions. This is the same writer. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I mean, this is, this is really simple, really practical information. How do I renew my mind? I, 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 I take account of what's contributing to my mind right now, and if it's not good, I get rid of it. Whatever it is. The magazines, the websites, the subscriptions, the TV shows, the movies, the music. If it's not giving me the goal that I want, it's got to go. And i got to replace it with something good. You remove and you replace. You don't seek a new mind. You're actually seeking his mind. You're seeking his mind. In fact, even in Romans chapter 8, he tells us, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip these verses because of time, but he tells us that we're, we, we need to seek the Holy Spirit. That's the bottom line. Because if you don't have him, none of this is going to work. This is not something that you can force. It's not something that you can make happen just by following these steps. This is something that we've got to do with him. You've got to have the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, read it. Go home and read it tonight. And you've got to guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You've got to guard your heart. It only takes a moment. It only takes a moment for that to slip. He says in, in, in Romans 12 too, that you may approve what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Prove it. Prove it. To prove, to accept as approved after testing. In other words, is it good? Is it acceptable? And is it perfect? Is it good? Is it acceptable? And is it perfect? Is it good according to his standard? Does it line up with God's word? That's how you know. Because if you're saying, okay, is this God's will? Listen, if it violates this, it's not. Is it acceptable? What is, what is acceptable? We learned this tonight. Well-pleasing. Is it well-pleasing to him? Does it line up with God's goals? Is it in harmony with others? Okay. And is it perfect? Is it, is it complete? Is it mature? That, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be fun. That's where the maturity comes in. You know, um, I, I heard a, a piece of advice, and this is a quote from Clarence Sexton that I heard in college that I've kept with me all these years. He says, God-given responsibilities never conflict. That's really good advice. Because God is not going to tell me to do something that is going to violate something else that he's told me to do. I will never have to choose between doing God's will for my life with my job and doing God's will for my life with my wife. I'll never have to fight that battle. You see, you see what I'm saying there? I'll never have to fight that battle because if God told me to do it, they're not going to be in conflict. So if there's a conflict there, one of those things is not in sync with God's will for my life. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It doesn't say all things are good. It says all things work together for good. And again, that's the, is it perfect? Is it mature? Is it complete? Okay. 
Does it prove? Does it stand the test? Hey, God is not trying to hide his will for us. He wants us to do it, and he wants to lead us to it. Stephen Davey said, um, our problem isn't the will of God that we don't know. Our problem is with the will of God that we do know. I don't have to worry about trying to figure out, you know, what he wants down the road. I just need to obey what he says today, and he'll show me what to do tomorrow. Have I chosen to be a living sacrifice today? Am I willing to lay still on that altar when he commands it? Am I willing to move and serve and worship? Do I believe it reasonable? Do I see him as worthy? Is it my rational response to serve him? Do I care? enough. What are your goals right now for the kingdom of God? What are you striving to accomplish for Christ today? If you go to the plains of Africa, there are two types of creatures that care, the lion and the gazelle. The gazelle wants to live another day, but that lion, he wants to eat. Because if he doesn't, he's not going to live either. And you know, it really doesn't matter what they want. What really matters is how much they want it. You know who's going to win that battle? It's the one who cares the most. That lion knows If I give all my energy today and I miss that gazelle, if I don't catch that gazelle, if I exert all this energy and I don't get to eat, i got to waste another day to eat. I'm in trouble because tomorrow I'm not going to have the same strength. Tomorrow I'm not going to have the same focus. Tomorrow I'm not going to have the same drive. Tomorrow I'm not going to have the same energy because I didn't eat. So I've got to care enough that I see that opportunity Today, and when I see that gazelle come by, I've got to go get it. But on the other hand, that gazelle, that gazelle thinks if I can just elude that lion, if I can just elude that lion, I can live another day. If I can just elude that lion, I can get home to my family. If I can just elude that lion, I can get home to my babies. If I can just elude that lion, I can be better for my family. If I can just elude that lion just one more day, I can beat this addiction. If I can just elude that lion, the one who's going to win is the one that cares the most. It's the lion in the gazelle church. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your lot in life is. I don't care who your mama is, who your daddy is. I don't care what they did. I don't care your background. I don't care how much money you have or don't have. Amen. Um, I don't care who has set themselves against you. All I'm saying right now is until we care, we can't move forward. We got to care. Romans chapter 1 or 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, I beg you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's bow for prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. And the wisdom that we can find therein. Lord God, I pray that you would help us to carry these truths with us and apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.